This week, our characters continue to struggle with their imprisonment. And I don't mean this literally. A year after slicing the crab feeder in two, Damon returns to King's Landing, seemingly a better man. With a primer hairstyle and a reserved demeanor, he looks the part of a loyal prince to his king. Yet, by the end of the hour, Damon demonstrates that this propriety is fleeting, as the dragon within can't help but break free. Rhaenyra is skeptical about the new Damon early on. She questions his purpose once they're alone, but instead of getting a satisfying answer, they end up discussing the merits of political marriages in a tragic world. They speak in High Valerian for quite some time, which I appreciate because it shows that the creators are committed to immersion over a viewer's convenience, but also because it illustrates the deep connection between niece and uncle. The unsettling chemistry between the two has been simmering since the start of the season, but this is the episode where Damon's sinister intentions become evident. Before Damon lures Rhaenyra from out of her cage, she has a heart-to-heart -heart with Alicent. Those of us rooting for Rhaenyra's and Alicent's friendship, or more, rejoice. They're back on good terms for now, though Rhaenyra remains a bit insensitive to Alicent's position. Alicent tries to make the best of her lonesome confinement as the queen, Tending to Viserys' sore-ridden body in the bath is only a precursor to what awaits her. While Rhaenyra gets to escape via a perhaps too convenient secret passage, Alicent must mentally prepare when summoned to the king's bedside. Not only are they trapped in a castle, but also in the roles prescribed to them as women. So it's no surprise that Rhaenyra is overjoyed when she is mistaken for a boy in her disguise. The parodic play is clear. The people don't question the worthiness of an heir when they're a boy. Rhaenyra is a haughty princess who dismisses the town folk. But perhaps she should heed Damon's words and be concerned with the people if she is to rule them. A more mature Rhaenyra may want to win the people over instead of letting their prejudice fester for an entitled ruler. Of course, the right thing to do is to abolish the monarchy altogether, but that's beyond the boundaries of the series, and apparently contemporary England. Damon is more concerned with Rhaenyra's maturity in the creepy uncle kind of way as he takes her to a pleasure house. Now, I'm still waiting for a more nuanced take on the sex trade in this franchise, but it's good to see a variety of sexual appetites here. But it's not all peachy at the brothel. Is this woman all right? Maybe she's just exhausted. Most troubling is Damon and Rhaenyra in the middle of it all. Damon's grooming is seemingly complete when things get complicated. Rhaenyra turns back around when she is pressed against the wall and goes in for kisses, which Damon rejects. Did Damon's conscience kick in? Or maybe he can't get off when he is not in complete control. We've seen him have issues before, so there may be more to his impotence that's yet to be revealed. Whatever the case, we're left as perplexed as Rhaenyra. What's clear is that Damon doesn't care much for Rhaenyra. Regardless of her response in the midst of the sex den, Damon manipulated his niece for years to get her there and then leaves her alone in a vulnerable state when things don't go his way. Meanwhile, there's marital rape at the king's bedchamber. Remember when Rhaenyra flippantly remarked about not wanting to end up an imprisoned wife made to squeeze out heirs, and Alicent was visibly distraught? Her mind was probably going back to this horror show. After all that, 
one might find comfort in Rhaenyra bedding her longtime crush, Sir Kristen Cole. Their sex scene is tender in comparison, lovingly shot by director Claire Kilner. Rhaenyra couldn't have hoped for better, right? Well, what about Kristen's say in all this? As princess, Rhaenyra is in the power position this time around, and she uses that power to compel Kristen to have sex with her, who, by the way, swore an oath of celibacy to be on the king's guard. To expect him to comply without hesitation, because he is a man, is just another example of gender essentialism. I don't think the rebellious Rhaenyra notices Kristen's discomfort that night or the morning after. Back in the city, Masaria returns with some wisdom. Hard lessons are not welcomed, but suffered. She's rescued Damon from the previous night's drunken stupor, though he's not very grateful. Masaria now deals in information as the White Worm. Otto Hightower is one of her customers, and he tells Viserys about Rhaenyra and Daemon's scandalous escapade, which doesn't go well for Otto. Viserys' tactic to get to the truth is to be antagonistic with all parties involved. He lashes out at his brother, who claims he went all the way with Rhaenyra. Then Daemon's motives at last come to light. He asks for Rhaenyra's hand in marriage to bolster the Targaryen's power. Viserys sees this as nothing more than an attempt from his brother to take the throne, and so banishes him once more. At the Weirwood Tree, Alicent and Rhaenyra's relationship begins to crack once again. Like a conservative mother, Alicent berates Rhaenyra for being sullied by Daemon. In turn, Rhaenyra omits some details, perhaps to repress some of those memories herself, and denies any wrongdoing. Technically, Rhaenyra and Damon stopped short of intercourse. She doesn't lie. She just, she's just not lying. She didn't sleep with Damon. She actually didn't sleep with Damon. He couldn't do it. She dare not mention her romp with Kristen, for his sake, and because of sexist yada yada. She must remain a virgin to marry a noble lord. Alicent believes her, but as Viserys tells Rhaenyra, the truth doesn't matter. Perception is what counts. Viserys again reminds his daughter of her responsibility, this time showing off the written prophecy on the dagger we now see revealed by the fire. The visual is derivative of Lord of the Rings but it's effective world building, though it might have worked better to combine this scene with the first lore dump in episode one. The less we're reminded of the original Game of Thrones ending, the better. Anyway, here Rhaenyra echoes her uncle in pointing out sexist double standards. Were I born a man, I could bet him if I wanted. I could father a dozen bastards, and no one in your court would blink an eye. When we were in Nira's age, we fucked our way through most of the brothels on the street of silk. We were young men. But you were born a woman. Rhaenyra agrees to marry Sir Laenor Valarian if Viserys fires the vulture on his throne, Otto. And so he does. I wonder what Alicent will think of this. We end with the maester delivering some moon tea to Rhaenyra. It's the Westeros equivalent of the morning after pill. Rhaenyra was all about cake in the first episode, but to win the public over, she should forego the Marie Antoinette approach and instead go with the slogan, let them have contraception. Though, if making contraceptives is as hard as brewing a good tea in Westeros, then maybe it's already easily accessible. That might explain all the hedonism we see in this episode and on those tapestries. <laughs>